Today we're talking about the protector of the green, Swamp Thing. Welcome to the Oblivion Bar, a safe haven for all DC comic fans. I'm your host, Kali Hill, and with the new live-action Swamp Thing TV series coming to the DC Universe, we decided it's only appropriate to discuss the main character of the show, Alec Holland, a.k.a. Swamp Thing. Guys, what did you think of the book? I mean, thus far, pretty good. More more scary than I would have maybe anticipated uh, overall. <laughs> uh, but... Excellent so far. No no significant complaints by me. I mean, I definitely was not expecting the amount of terrifying I got. Um, I was I was thinking Swamp Thing. I was like, oh cool, superhero, super villain. It's a, mm, that was a different level. Yeah, I like this book a lot. Um, so much so that I own it. So <laughs> that's <should, laughs> it's a good book. Bye. <laughs> You know, <laughs> can't say much more than that. Yeah, I mean, I have haven't read any single Swamp Thing runs, but I've read him a lot in Justice League Dark, and I've seen him in TV shows, and you see him in the Justice League Dark animated series, so I love the character, but I was not expecting to read a horror flick. Panel for panel, just scared, out of your mind kind of book. Yeah, but it, that's, that's also what kind of drew you in and kept you reading was <laughs> sure, terrifying. Sure. You're like, oh my God, <laughs> there's no way this is getting more terrifying. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah, yeah you like, you're like, I don't want to turn panel. I don't want to turn page. I don't want to, and you flip it. You're like, oh my God, you got to keep going. It's, yeah, no, it was, it was horrifying. Like, yeah, just other world, scary level stuff. But you have Alec Holland here as Swamp Thing. What do you think of his reluctance to pick up his mantle of Swamp Thing. Do you agree with him, I, I personally, I think it kind of makes sense. You have another being that is made out of a swamp, in the most literal terms, that is mimicking a human, and it's saying, hey, you're the next one. Good luck. <laughs> no, I, I, I feel you on that. I What gets me is how pretentious Superman can be when he flies over and tells him, like, hey, I save millions of people. You could save so many more with your powers. Dude, he's not you. Like, you <laughs> can turn it on and off. You can be Clark Kent, and then you can be Superman. You look like a Caucasian American man. <laughs> he's going to look like a big, nasty monster, and you can't just turn that off. It's as privileged as it gets to... <laughs> he's going to be turning a lot of other people off, though. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Ethan? Do you agree with his reluctance? Um, I understand it, but I don't agree with it. Because I, personally, if given the opportunity to get any superpowers, no matter how mundane, I would take it. And I wouldn't ask questions. <laughs> even yeah. if your powers are a curse? Like yes. Even if, <laughs> there you go. I'm already <laughs> cursed with these good looks. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's uh, subjective. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. <laughs> oh, either it's okay. I love you. Um, he's a oh, guest he's on your show. <laughs> we love him. We love him. All right, Robbie, do you, what do you do? You agree with his reluctance? Uh, I I'm with Ethan, and I understand the reluctance, especially since he doesn't really remember him being Swamp Thing just recently, and he's still like kind of getting those memories flooding back to him, and he's really unsure. He's not really sure of what he is at this point. So I understand why he's hesitant, but I would also agree with Ethan and be like, yeah, superpowers, of course. I don't care if I look ugly. I already look kind of ugly, so it's fine. <laughs> I agree. There has never been a day in my life that's gone by where I haven't just wanted superpowers. I mean, but... No, there's no but. He should take the superpower. <laughs> <laughs> Superman needs to get off his freaking high horse is my only point. He, he annoys the me only with that <laughs> All right, so we see Alec meet... Abigail and we see Alec meet the former protector of the green. Do you think he can trust Abigail or do you think he should heed the warning of the former protector? I think he not only should trust Abigail, I think he kind of has to. So you come in on him, he's living in a motel. I don't even know if he has a car. So I don't know if he has a way to get from place to place. But she definitely does. She has a motorcycle. So that alone, like, 
I'm gonna hang out with her. <laughs> she just seems like a cool lady, you know? <laughs> the haircut aside, she yeah. seems pretty trustworthy. <laughs> Questionable hair choices, but, and I don't, the first thing I noticed about a person is their hair, so that would have instantly turned me off from listening to a thing. She's, I've been like, go to the hairdresser first, then come back when you got a sense of what you're doing up there. But, <laughs> get yourself together. <laughs> no, I think that. I think out of the both of them, he should trust the former protector of the green. I mean, he's been Swamp Thing before. Um, Alec, Alec has been Swamp Thing before. He knows he's been Swamp Thing before. So, I, mean, I know he knows the baggage that comes with it, but in this case, he also knows what's at stake without the, with the when the world doesn't have a protector of the green. Like, that is a vital part of... The functioning of Earth. I mean, the ecosystem and everything. It needs its protector. I think he has to trust her for the time being, given the situation that he's in at the end of the third volume. Like, there's not really... Especially if he's not going to accept his powers as a Swamp Thing right this second. They're only going to kind of come out when he needs them to. That he needs someone to look after him, because there's crazy undead things clawing after him right now. But later down the line, whether he can trust her or not... Uh, I'm still on the fence about it, but for now, I think he needs to. Yeah. So, work with her? Yes. Trust her? No. Okay, um, the first real interaction he had with her was shotgun in the face. True. That's, um, that's gonna put a damper on anything and everything, in my opinion. So, will I work with her because she has my best interests at heart? What, you don't say hello by pointing a shotgun at your best friend's face or whatever? I mean, that's how people greet each other in some countries. Shotgun to the face. What countries? Djibouti, maybe. Djibouti, Djibouti? Djibouti, Djibouti. I doubt they do that. They probably don't. Sorry, Um, Djiboutians. (laughs) Djiboutians? Sorry about that. But still, like, would I work with her? Yes. Would I keep my distance, keep my eye on her? Yes. Would I let her... Follow me into a dark corner? No, I'm going to follow her because I don't know what she's going to pull on me. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> Just one option in her arsenal, right? <laughs> Who knows what she has hidden in the hair of hers? <laughs> Joe, what did you bring us to drink tonight? So what I brought um, was a little bit fun with the whole swamp thing. Um, um, we have a very hoppy beer it is an Imperial IPA, the 90 Minutes IPA by Dogfish Head. Um, again, probably one of my top five breweries. Um, it's very hoppy. You get hops, malts, and probably toffee in my opinion. I know, Ethan, you said chocolate when we talked about it, but um, it's it's a very good drink it, in my opinion. It was probably the first IPA that I had that got me into IPAs. Yeah, I think it's a pretty solid beer. It's I it's interesting because I definitely taste the hops in it, but it's not very bitter, surprisingly, for how much of the hops that I taste, which I really enjoy. Right. This is a good beer. You guys should buy it. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, moving on. We're introduced to this sweet little kid named William who lives in a bubble. Super sweet. (laughs) Out in the desert. Poor William in a bubble. Poor William in a bubble. Now, okay, knowing that William is destined to cause so much devastation and destruction, do you think Abigail should have just done away with her or done something other than what she did to handle the situation or do you agree with how she handled it i totally agree with how she handled it i mean he's her half brother and if you believe her story of the fact that she knows that these urges from the rot which are kind of manipulating and controlling his actions are able to be kind of repelled then i think that he is potentially able to be saved even though he has kind of this intertwined fate being a part of the arcane family and everything like that i think going off that though that yes i don't think she should have killed him because i don't know if that's morally right actually it definitely isn't morally right. <laughs> don't kill people especially your half brothers that are destined to destroy the world 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that she maybe should have stayed in his life as like an influence of some sort because she's obviously saying like, hey, we're not going to go to the rot. Like we're going to fight against this. And without her there constantly like reminding him or helping him through that process, it's going to get a lot harder for Willie the Bubble Boy. Yeah. I actually <laughs> like that explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Willie the Bubble Boy. Yeah, that's, good. that's, a, that's a great little, little tag for him. <laughs> Willie oh, the, Willie the, the Bubble Boy. Willie the Bubble Boy. <laughs> okay, I like that explanation a lot because I was stone cold about this at first because it made me think of, okay, if I knew that Hitler was going to do all of this stuff and had the chance to stop it, would I stop it? I tell myself, yes, I would. But I think that the better option would have been to kind of walk with him through life. If you've had this experience yourself, if you know these urges, why lock him away in a place that, one, he's in a desert surrounded by all this dead crap. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly what yeah. I'm saying. When I saw this, she was like, yeah, put him in a desert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Did we not already discuss the information that the deserts were the rot? lives and where your urges are going to be stronger but but he's deathly allergic to chlorophyll <laughs> so. <laughs> so so i want to take that and put down the fact that he's in a bubble yeah but say if you know one of the kids stabs it with a fork because you know they clearly want to do that <laughs> as we've seen <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i mean but like seriously though, if, so, if there's some to them <laughs> right. he's just like ah, tumors <laughs> But, I mean, if something were to happen to the bubble, you'd want him to be in an environment that's less likely to have something deadly in the air. You know, you're not, if someone has a peanut allergy, you're not going to want to walk into the room with them with the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You can still eat your peanut butter and jelly sandwich at home, of course, but you just don't want to hospitals expose are, them. Hospitals are pretty sterile, right? You'd like to think. <laughs> I mean, why didn't she think to take him to some, I know this year, I feel like I know you're going to say, but why didn't she take him to some kind of place or organization that could keep him in a sterile environment like you have star labs yeah they'd want to run tests on him yeah they do experiments and junk but at least he wouldn't be out killing people you got the justice league yeah got the justice league just tell batman hey batman i gotta batman's gonna be like all right we need to do x y and z done i pay so for it all you're just gonna it. call batman on his private number then is that your plan <laughs> no i'm gonna commit a crime <laughs> in gotham that's gonna draw batman's attention and they're like hold up don't batarang me. Don't kung fu chop me. <laughs> Just listen. Look at me. I'm from, the possessed. <laughs> I'm from the swamp. <laughs> I'm from the swamp. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this book has some very, very, like we said, it's scary. Just very shocking visuals. What was the most shocking visual to you, Ethan? Um, I'm going to go with the very beginning of the book. The opening panels. You see birds fall out of the sky dead in Metropolis. Cuts to Batman surrounded by dead bats in his now normal cave. <laughs> <laughs> and then it cuts to Aquaman and all his fish friends are dead. So, you know, that's you pretty shocking. you had a funeral for them? Each one or to, like, Each collectively? Each one. Mm. I don't know. It depends I, don't on know. I don't know Aquaman that well, to be honest. Put your opinions in the comments. It depends on how much he cares about the fish, which I bet some of them are, are part of his diet. So, um, but also, Batman has enough money to buy more bats. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, Alfred, order more bats. <laughs> Clean this mess. <laughs> but uh, what was your most shocking? <laughs> Sure. Most shocking visual, Robert. Uh, so the most shocking visual to me was the diner scene where you see the super deformed, like crazy monster lurking outside the window of the yeah. diner, and then it enters in, and all the flies start flying down people's throats, and their heads start getting twisted. It was, I thought it was just absolutely terrifying, oh. and really well drawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it. But yeah, that was that seemed pretty terrifying to me. That whole creature is probably what scared me the most. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. William just <laughs> murdering everybody from inside his little bubble. <laughs> just everyone he dying. The <laughs> he was like, "Don't touch me with no fork." <laughs> he just blew in. I mean, I had to like, I had to like read it a couple times to realize. 
Oh, that's what his tumors were doing. I thought he, like, shattered his bones in multiple directions. <laughs> and then people were bleeding from their eyeballs. And I'm like, they have Ebola now. <laughs> Got freaked out. They got too and, the, and then the doctors walk in and he's like, I was like, what is happening? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, no. Um the other than the shocking visual of Abigail's hair, my <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what really did it for me <laughs> was freaking Susie swings a lot with her freaking giant axe. Her head turned, her head turned backwards, <laughs> like coming out of nowhere. I was like, run! <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> my, my thing is about that one like her body's pointing one direction her head's pointing one direction so where are her arms actually gonna go <laughs> like does her body just swing around with it and her she head had a it? mad backswing <laughs> it's all about the art of misdirection you see. <laughs> all right. there it is they got me on that one alright guys clearly we enjoyed this book if you're interested in reading it there will be a link in the bio below so that you can purchase it also, that ends our show for the day, but if you liked it, make sure you click that little thumbs up, and we upload videos weekly, so make sure you subscribe to our channel and click that little bell so you can be notified when we post, and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Bar Oblivion for updates. Question of the week, what Swamp Thing story would you like to see brought to life on the small screen? Leave your answers in the comments below, and we'll catch you guys next time at the Oblivion Bar. A large fresh orange is